Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for February 28th, 2021, the second Sunday of Lent. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The first reading is Genesis 17, 1 through 7, and 15 and 16. The psalm is Psalm 22, 23 through 31. Romans 4, 13 through 25 is the epistle, and the gospel reading is Mark 8, 31 through 38. So we skip from Mark 1 past Peter's confession, and uh, we land at uh, where Peter gets rebuked. Sort of hard to, it's sort of hard to, uh, get at this text in Mark 8 without realizing it's right after the confession, uh, because otherwise you might land and just, uh, Peter's a total dolt. And uh, I think I think they go together so much um, that it's not until Peter confesses him as the Christ that then he began to teach them. Yeah, and this is the first time there's any reference to death, suffering in Mark. It looked like this was going to be a story of healing after healing and em embarrassing uh, other leaders after embarrassment and, you know, and just inexorably moving forward. And now all of a sudden we get, an get the idea that this is going to have a particular ending. I, I mentioned last week, I'm in big favor of talking about how the gospel texts help us interpret the cross because the gospels have actually, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke have so little to say about what the cross does or why it matters. They narratively, of course, they emphasize it, but we don't get a lot of explanation, but this is one place with that little word must. And Brent Rigger spends some time talking about this in his commentary online, which is excellent. What does it mean that the son of man must undergo great suffering and rejection, be killed and rise again? How do we deal with that? And what does that mean about not just how the story is going to end, but for his ministry of healing and compassion in the here and now. The, the other verb that I like at the start of this is teach. Um, as you know, uh, I don't like to refer to these as the passion predictions because in our prediction obsessed culture, our prediction is primarily about whether it happens or not. It's, this is about teaching and it, what what the kingdom is this countercultural reality and that and I think teach goes with must you know I mean the uh, gospel doesn't say and then Jesus predicted he's trying to teach something central about the kingdom of God which is different than our primary reality uh, and it is about like you said Matt about what the cross why is the cross necessary why is the very identity of Jesus as the Christ why does that mean that he must die and I mean, if you want to go deep down that road, I mean, you have to, in my opinion, go to the opening chapters of First Corinthians just to do your own work about, you know, the foolishness of the cross. Um, but I, how much, let me ask you a question that I don't know the answer to. How, how much teaching do, do you have to do in assault, if that's the focus of your sermon? Um, I like teaching sermons myself, but I'm very oriented that way towards teaching. That's well, why I, I'm a teacher. I think I, um, I'm not sure. I I'm, I'm not sure how to. It depends on the text and it depends on the context, right? But but with this um, with this particular text, I think there is sort of a, a necessity for homiletical correction uh, or hom or teaching with regard particularly to taking up their cross, uh, taking up your cross and the way that is uh, perceived uh, historically as a kind of justification for suffering mm -hmm. uh, and a justification for a lot of different kinds of suffering from domestic abuse to uh, <clears throat> uh, all, all kinds of ways in which we've said, well, your suffering is justified just like Jesus's was. And, and that's where the context of this passage really matters and why 
you should add verses or at least pay attention to those verses because the the verse is not only the verses prior to this at beginning you know we're in the whole central section now of mark 822 through 1052 and uh, those opening verses, uh, yes, we have the confession, but of course we are also in Caesarea Philippi. And so the backdrop of, of the reality of the powers that are at play here. And uh, to, so in part to take up your cross is not to suffer uh, it, as it is to uh, do what Jesus is doing, which is to, uh, and not not back away from uh, claiming the these powers and principalities that uh, that are about suffering, that are about oppression, and so to take up one's cross is to name that, and that's exactly what the what's uh, the why why that backdrop is so important because the cross at the end of the day becomes. This is what this is what power. This is what empire does. It kills that which uh, calls attention to uh, its corruptness. And so, uh, I think um, to answer your question, Rolf, uh, that becomes a really critical piece to this. Uh, is to uh, is to recognize where is it that we back away from naming um, naming. The kind of kingdom that Jesus has in mind, uh, the kind of kingdom for which Jesus came, uh, particularly against the backdrop of the kingdoms that have the most power and the kingdoms that are in power. And what difference does it make to um, to make that profession or to take up your cross when you're standing against, you know, the temple of Pan uh, versus, uh, you know, someplace else. So that, that heightened reality of the geography here and the location uh, really, uh, I think, think does speak into a kind of corrective or teaching moment about what the cross means. And weaving together, uh, as um, you pointed out, Rolf, that this only happens after Jesus has been named as the Christ. Um, that in uh, what you were saying, Caroline, as we uh, recognize the evil and corruption that empires, you know, that other empires, not God's uh, reign, but other empires um, are, that are inherent in other empires. Wow, I speak for a living, but not this morning. Um, um, let me try that again. The um, evil and oppression that is inherent in uh, the empires of this world when they the corruption is called out as you said caroline there is going to be a need for the people of god to talk about the fact that there's evil you know and when we turn this into simply a permission to say well my suffering has a greater end it's it's not humbling ourselves before god it is doing exactly what Jesus calls Peter out on. Peter is saying, oh, no, 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 this can't happen to you. And, and Jesus is talking publicly. Peter takes him aside and say, hey, you know, let's, let's have this side conversation um, and, and, and make this something more powerful for you. And Jesus takes it back publicly and says, no, this is not about me. This is not about the empires of this world. This is about the presence of God and God's goodness that will overcome the evil of the empires of this society. I really appreciate you guys weaving that together. Well, I think what you just said, uh, Joy, is really key there, that th this is about the presence of God, which then offers a, a, a really critical perspective on what does it mean to lose your life for the sake of the gospel? Uh, because how do we define gospel or how do we think of gospel? Uh, you know, the, the reality is that, you know, gospel was used in 1-1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then 114, trust in the gospel. Well, what do we, what is that? That is, for the sake of the gospel, the presence of God in Jesus right here and right now. And so, uh, so that, that also becomes an important, um, important lens through which to, uh, think about what it, what is this all for the sake of, uh, and it's for the sake of the gospel that is uh, that insists on God's kingdom here, uh, and that and and that 
God's kingdom is at work and giving witness to that, yes. uh, confessing that reality, um, and particularly in moments and places where we don't want to, yeah. <laughs> where you feel the least comfortable, yeah. where we're the most frightened uh, and the most resistant. Or coming up against the most resistance. Yes, that good news that God's promise for peace and God, when God is present among us, is trustworthy, and we see it made real in Jesus being the Messiah that has long been promised and awaited. I just want to affirm everything that's been said about that, about that, um, the importance of the imperial context uh, with all of this, and and not making this about suffering somehow being redemptive in and of itself. At the same time, I also don't want to lose that that imperative. We have these various third person imperatives of deny yourself. And I think all those imperatives have to interpret one another and, and that sense of, of, of self renunciation isn't to invite abuse in, in ways that we named, but it is also to find a new, the part of this gospel is to find a new sense of belonging, is to find a new sense of identity. Jesus will redefine that in some ways as new family in Mark chapter three, which is a rather offensive thing for him to do in that setting, in that context. But I think it's also here that part of what's being called in giving up your life is giving up this notion of how you're defined, to whom you belong, to whom you belong, and then taking on a new family, the part of the promise of his, of his ministry, we see this again in Mark 10, is this idea of you now have new brothers, sisters, siblings, uh, children, you now belong to this new emerging society, which is a powerful thing for people who are looking to have kind of an old identity altered. Uh, it's also a, a, a helpful thing if, you're, if your identity is getting you persecuted. It's a really dangerous thing in the context of empire as well to now have a new kinship group that's harder to control or harder to track uh, and things like that. So there is a call to discipleship here that also though is very much um, giving up one's own What's the word I want to use here? I mean, you could say self, and the question is, well, what is a self? But giving up one sense of of connection and the advantages or disadvantages that might come with that for the sake of a new community of belonging. And if you let me, I'm going to go into to Genesis uh, in the idea of um, what will be new in our identity in this family that Jesus invites us is, is actually a recovery of the family we were created to be uh, as, as the children of God. And, and this, this promise that is made to Abraham and Sarah uh, is made uh, coming off of last week uh, in light of the continued depravity that we see in Genesis 11. And, for the sake of all of humanity, God invest in this old couple and make a promise to all humanity. I've said this so many times before, um, and, and all humanity that this will be that new family. This will be that new identity, but it's a recovery of who, who uh, humanity is when we are faithful to, to God. And it's a big family. <laughs> it's a it's a it's much bigger than the um, tr the narrow tribe that we are comfortable with, or that we have been put in by others who have marginalized us. Yeah, I noted that this time reading it. You know, it's exceedingly numerous, right? A multitude of nations. I kept thinking, like, where's the promise about land? I'm like, oh yeah, that's a different passage. This one is just about lots and lots of people. I find it exhausting in the middle of a pandemic where I've, you know, been totally isolated. This thought of like, actually, it sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like a lot of cooking. Actually, the promise about land is in the excised verses in the middle, verse eight. It is there. Ah, that's right. Okay, I just skipped over it, too quickly. Well, it's this is the uh, there's a little anti-Jewish bias in excising those verses because the because you have both the land and you have the circumcision in that text so christians uh the christians who uh chose the chose to cut those verses out um at this it's problematic to cut them out 
is what I'm trying to say. And I think there's the reason they were cut out as an anti-Jewish bias. Can we add verses? Are we allowed to do that? I don't know, Caroline, have we ever, I don't think we're allowed to do that, are we, Caroline? What? Add verses? No. Have we ever done that? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we've ever suggested that. Because yeah. no, I'd, I'd add it to remind ourselves that that, that land was promised um, in, in the very beginning, go in, uh, uh, you know, go into all the earth uh, is, is the promise. And when God scatters all the people, it's actually doing what uh, was the original instruction given to humanity. And so this promise to land to the people who are blessing all those scattered nations is if we retranslate it, Ralph, as you that as your allusion is, we've mistranslated it. We retranslate it into God is giving to all those people scattered the blessing that is represented in this family of Abraham. But I cut you off, Caroline. Well, I was going to. Uh, I'm going to cut Caroline off if that's all right, just because there's also perhaps an anti-Muslim uh, issue here because in verse it stops at verse 16 and then verse 18. Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. Uh, and finally, maybe there's just a, uh, let me just say it positively, instead of talking about the biases of people that I don't know, and they're all, they're all dead by now, um, who made these choices probably. Um, let me say it positively. This text is about Sarah, not Abraham. Abraham already has a child. God has come to Abraham twice with the covenantal promises, Genesis 12, Genesis 15. Then Ishmael is born in chapter 16. God comes again to Abraham and Abraham's like, okay, again with the covenantal promise? Are you forgetful? You know, is, is, is God getting like some of our parents uh, who, yeah, you've, um, we've had this conversation four times, have you, which makes me think that you haven't talked to my three siblings. You've called me three times four times now, uh, you know, um, but actually, no, God is not forgetful. What God is doing is saying, this is about Sarah. This, this promise is not just for Abraham, uh, which is uh, why I really do like to continue the text because Abraham doesn't get it. He goes, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight, meaning I don't need another kid. I've got the promise. The covenant's good. And God's like, no, no, no. This is about Sarah. Sarah is the mother of this people. So, uh, um, wow, wow, Ralph, that is a powerful read. And I know, Caroline, you're itching to get in here, but that is a powerful read. And I really appreciate it because it it's one of those places where um, this idea that says, uh, th this text literally says, um, uh, oh, sorry, it's not. It's it, we're going to get to it when we when we get to uh, to Romans, where it it highlights the fact that Abraham uh, uh, held on to this promise in his old age, even though it it the body should not have kept it. And yet, what you're highlighting is this recognition that they didn't hold on to the promise. They thought they could help God out. They were like, "Okay, God, you made this promise, but you can't do it with us. But we can help you out." And that's the problem. Whenever we stop trusting that God can do what God says God will do which is what the Romans text highlights, is when we get ourselves in trouble. Um, wow, I, man, I've got to go back. I've got to, I, I got to look at, listen to this one again, Ralph. That was a great, great move. Thank you. Do you remember what you were going to say, Caroline? I went in a different direction, so it's no, it's, that's fine. We can move on to the Psalm. He was going to talk about the Psalm 22 commentary, I thought. <laughs> Thank you for your commentary, Rolf. Thank you. I, yeah, I um, one of the reasons I still write on the Psalms for Working Preacher. This is a new commentary. You know, sometimes it'll say commentary by Rolf Jacobson first appeared in 2011. You know, um, or something like that. Uh, this is a this uh, this is a new commentary, and I asked Ben to still find Psalms that I haven't yet written on for the this cycle, and he found one here. Um, I was not. I was not really aware All of right. this. He found one. <laughs> <laughs> well, he found another one in a couple of weeks too. So uh, I might have soon written on all of the Psalms. That's my goal is to get the thing finished. Uh, I haven't written on, but although I haven't written on every Psalm for every 
liturgical context yet. But um, I think, uh, all right, I just submitted a sermon for a collection of sermons on the Psalms, the 150 Psalms, and I did Psalm 22. And of course I did Psalm 22 versus the first part of it for uh, which is, you know, a Good Friday text. Um, I have not been aware of this ending. Of course, everybody knows, oh, it ends happy, but actually to study it, and as I talk about in the commentary, which really fits then, it really is a very fitting response to the first reading, how the, um, the voices who are called to join in the praise of God, there's nothing like this that I know of in the Psalter, where it starts off internally, and this is I talk about with you who fear the Lord, then it's, you know, then it goes to all Israel, then all those who seek the Lord, the ends of the earth, all families of the nations, which really fits with the promise to Abraham and Sarah that they will be the father and motherhood, father and mother of a multitude of nations. But then even the dead, all who sleep in the earth, all who go to the dust, and then even the future. I just think this is, there's no psalm like this in terms of talking about the universal swell of the grace of God to reach out to all people, but even to the past and future. That's kind of a mind blowing concept, isn't it? Well, and that's the, that's the connection I think too, with uh, the promise to Abraham that, that, that the universality or that, that the, the uh, vastness of God's promises uh, to all people is, is in part what the psalmist is calling attention to. And I, the one line I really appreciated in your commentary, Rolf was uh, toward the end where you said, by praising God, we align our very selves with God, and I I think that I think that could be a really uh, important and meaningful homiletical direction uh, on this. Uh, if if the, you know if this is what you decide to do for this particular Sunday of of thinking about um, thinking about what what does it mean to praise God, and in and in doing that, we're aligning ourselves with God's vision and God's promises and God's covenants and God's steadfastness and God's love. And I don't know that we think about praise very often in that way. And so both the Genesis text and this text uh, remind us of, of what's, it, what's, at, at the, what's inherent to our praise is not just, oh, thanks, God. Uh, I worship you. You're great. You're awesome. It's, it's actually... <laughs> aligning ourselves and saying, um, yes, this is what God does and this is who God is and I'm on board with it. Uh, so it has, it, I, I think it, I, I really appreciated that. Thank you. I, I will call attention to the fact that that might be, diff some might think that's a difficult message right now because we, a lot of us can't, even if we are in person worship, we can't praise God right now uh, because singing together where you spray this aerosol out 30 to 50 feet is a super spreader. Remember at the start of the pandemic, Caroline, a town in which you and I both used to live, although separately, we, uh, we didn't live at the same town, was a super spreader moment where a choir gathered in Mount Vernon, Washington early on and that choir was, so we can't praise right now, but I think we can talk about, but we will be able to soon. We will be able to do this soon. And, be, and that's really what the promise of the Psalm is about. Um, uh, others will be joining this group. Um, I've actually experienced this spiritually and, and communally, the power of praise, um, that of, of being, having those spiritual moments while praising God in worship and just that being, me being changed by the song. Uh, we, don't, we don't sing these songs of praise because uh, they say what we already mean. But as we sing them, we come to mean what they say. Uh, and I think to me, that's just a powerful moment. And I had a friend, uh, I still have this friend, uh, probably because we've praised God together. I was so mad at. Um, he had done something that I considered so wrong. But we ended up praising God for two hours one night together. Uh, right after this. And I, at the end of praising God for two hours, I could not be mad at him anymore and he could not be uh, mad at me. And so praising God changes us. 
if I circle back to what Matt was saying earlier about uh, recognizing the generations and the, 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 the various families and the expanse of, of those that are being, uh, that this promise is being delivered to, uh, I, I want to remind us, uh, and, and, and Ralph, maybe I should ask this, uh, the gathering together for worship uh, in, in the ancient uh, days, um, the worship was done in small communities, and then there were these big festivals where folks gathered together. You're nodding yes. I'm nodding yes. You've got that uh, yes. Um, there were uh, Levites were spread around Israel in every village, and mm -hmm. and so there were local rituals. But then there was, of course, the big things, especially the three big festivals at the central worship sites. I appreciate that because I, I I'm. I'm thinking of reminding ourselves that we're in this season, this in-between season of Lent, and we're living out this uh, in-betweenness of uh, quarantine and pandemic, and that we do praise God in our smaller context, and we look forward to the opportunity to gather together in the future and um, to hold on to the promise that God isn't going to destroy. Going back to to uh, the uh, the Noah, Noah uh, catastrophe, um, but that God isn't going to destroy all of us in this, and so we will in the future be able to gather together. But that even in our small times, even me living alone, I still get to praise God. I, I just I just want to remind folks of that as we live in this in between season of Lent. Let's pick up Romans 4. I mentioned earlier that um, going back to the teaching about the cross, um, that really 1 Corinthians, and we get that next week, by the way, we get some 1 Corinthians, but uh, the Romans 4 is not a bad place to go either. Um, I said then throwing it to one of my colleagues to continue. Yeah, well, it's clearly trying to you know say, hey, the New Testament talks about Abraham too and helps us with <laughs> Genesis 17, which... May or may not be helpful. If, if if Genesis 17 is all about Sarah's importance, uh, Paul missed that entirely, which might not be the only time Paul missed things like that. Well, but, although I will say that Paul does get Sarah in Galatians, but let's not go there. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. We need a lot longer podcast for that one, I think. But the this idea of faith could be really helpful here, and and especially if Abraham is an example for that, not just the fact that he believed God, but with the kind of risks he took with his own life and 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 dragged others along with him. Uh, and then, of course, Jesus in his own exemplification of faithfulness. And we, we get a sense that this is not at all about just belief, which we talked about a week ago, right? Cognitively assenting to truths about God, uh, but is a, is a discipleship with a real cost, right? And the things that we should be worried about are, are probably not things that are easily quantifiable. And, and you know, we, we set up these, these enemies of faith or enemies of the church uh, in ways that, that are probably less helpful than looking at our own shortcomings, right? And our own failings of faith and, and the ways in which this is a, a costly discipleship, but also one in which God proves to be faithful over and over again, just like Paul's getting at here, just like the story of Abram and, and Sarah reiterates, like we talked about earlier. So that's where I would go. Uh, our, our difficulty in trusting, but God's utter trustworthiness towards us. And that's part of what uh, Paul is getting at, I think, uh, in verse 18, you know, that, that, that trust is, uh, trust alongside trust is hope. And so that line of hoping against hope or another translation is um, when hope seemed hopeless, mm -hmm. uh, that, that there's, there's a, there's a uh, integration of, of hope and belief that, uh, that, that makes both possible. Or in that language, um, when hope unborn had died. <laughs>